Welcome to Season 1, Episode 2 of Dark Case Serial Killers. This is the case of the truck stop killer, Robert Ben Rhodes. Viewer discretion is advised for this educational documentary. Welcome or welcome back to Dark Case Documentaries. I bring you true crime, disturbing stories and other things that you may later regret knowing with regular uploads every week. Please do join the quickly growing, incredibly supportive Dark Case family by hitting subscribe now and turning on notifications. Remember, choosing to be kind can save a life in many ways. Thank you so much for choosing to be here with me. Patricia Candice Walsh, then 23 years of age, was born in Seattle, Washington. According to her brother, she was known for her devotion to Jesus Christ and her enthusiasm for sharing the good news with anyone who was willing to listen. She had a strong commitment to her faith and was described as a dedicated follower of Jesus. In 1989, Patricia tied the knot with Douglas Scott Zakowski. He was 26 years old at the time and also hailed from Seattle. Like like Patricia, Douglas was a devoted Christian and their shared religious beliefs seemed to have played a significant role in bringing them together. In November, the newlywed couple opted for hitchhiking from Seattle to Georgia in order to participate in a religious workshop and preach the Christian gospel. Seattle to Georgia, by the way, is nearly 3,000 miles. As someone not from the US, these distances seem surreal. The couple made it to Seattle and participated in the event. All was well. It was now time to do the reverse journey. On their way back, they accepted a ride near El Paso, Texas. However, they never made it home. In fact, Patricia and Douglas were never heard from again. The couple's families decided to report them as missing. 18-year-old Shana Holt had been out on the streets by her own account, living a tough life ever since she was about 12 years old. On January the 29th, nearly a month after Patricia Walsh and Douglas Sikowski's disappearance, Shana was trying to hitch a ride in California. During the course of her journey, Shana met a trucker who introduced himself as Dustin. He offered to take her east towards Arizona. She accepted the man's offer, he seemed harmless, and the two set out on the road. It wasn't long before Shana fell asleep in the sleeping compartment of the truck after several hours of travelling. Having realised that Shana fell asleep, the man stopped the truck. In a matter of moments, he made his way into the sleeping compartment and assaulted her. Shana, stirring from her slumber, sensing that something was going horribly wrong, awoke to find that she had been chained to the walls. Before engaging in non-consensual intimate attacks, the trucker had severely violated her with sharp and piercing implements. Shana remained trapped inside the truck for six days before the trucker forced her into his residence in Houston. Inside the home, she was allowed to bathe. She, again, found herself chained to the bed and left helpless as she was violated repeatedly. When the trucker was done with her, he went to the bathroom. As he returned to the bedroom, she caught a glimpse of the straight razor the trucker was holding in his hand. Chills ran down Shana's spine. Imagine being in this position, believing this would be your final moment. But in a bizarre twist, the trucker began to slice off Shana's hair. Following this strange act, there was sadly three hours of continuous violation. And then the man decided to bring her back into the truck. This time, however, he did not shackle her, perhaps believing he had broken her spirit. Instead, he instructed her to sit there and be a good girl. The two drove off once more. The trucker soon decided he needed a refreshment break and pulled the truck off the road. She watched as a trucker walked into the Houston brewery. Shana bravely took this opportunity to flee the cab, escaping the nightmare. She ultimately got away unnoticed. She was out of the man's sight. 
With a dog leash around her neck and barely clothed, she began to run frantically to try to stop passing vehicles. When one driver realised the girl was in serious need of help, he pulled over. Shana told him she had been kidnapped and severely maltreated. The man drove her to a nearby phone booth to alert the police. The police drove Shana along the road with them as a search for the truck began. After a short while, they were able to locate and track down the truck that fit Shana's description. The police brought Shana in front of the driver to look at him and determine whether he was the man who had assaulted her. Instead, there must have been a mistake. She looked down and said that they had the wrong man. The man was let go. Shana, still in shock, was taken to the hospital for treatment. Later that day, she admitted to Special Agent Robert F. Lee of the FBI's Houston field that the man that was caught earlier was the individual who had kidnapped her. Shana was exhausted and terrified. She refused to press charges and told Agent Lee that all she wanted to do was just go home. During the two-week ordeal, Shana was completely traumatised and terrorised by the man, pushed to the point where she lacked the strength to press charges. She additionally said in her statement that she did not believe there was sufficient evidence to charge or sue the man. The perpetrator was free to roam the country. Perhaps now after he faced the police and walked free, he felt empowered, invincible. Regina K. Walters was a 14-year-old daughter of a divorce couple. She lived in Houston with her father. On occasion, she would pay visits to her mother who lived in Pasadena, Texas. In February 1990, Regina was in Pasadena to visit her mother, Carolyn. She was a single mother who worked as a department store clerk for extended periods of time. On February the 3rd, Regina and Carolyn got into a heated dispute. At around 9 o'clock in the evening, Regina told her mother that she was going out to see a friend. Mother Carolyn refused to let her go. Regina insisted that it would be a quick visit and that she would not be late. Carolyn was eventually persuaded and Regina left. The next day when Carolyn arrived home from work, she realised her daughter was not home. She had never returned. Despite numerous attempts to contact her, Carolyn was unable to find out where her daughter had gone. Regina had been gone for a few days when Carolyn finally decided to file a missing persons report. She contacted the Pasadena police and provided them with Regina's description. According to Suzanne Jackson, who was assigned to the case, Regina would normally call her mother when she left the house and let her know that she was okay when she was out. She would just come back when she was ready to go home, but this time she concerningly had not done so. Carolyn decided to distribute flyers around town with a photo of Regina, along with a reward for information about her daughter's whereabouts. Five days after the incident, Regina's mother received a phone call. The caller said that he saw Regina talking to two men on the 3rd of February, the very day she left her mother's residence. The only information that the caller provided about the men was that their names were Billy and Ricky. The next day, Carolyn was contacted by a second caller who claimed to have seen Regina at a party two days prior. The apartment manager told the police that the residence where the party was held was rented to a Billy Wayne Gibbs. The next morning it came to light that 17-year-old Billy Wayne Gibbs, along with his housemate who was also Regina's boyfriend Ricky Lee Jones, were wanted for auto theft. Officers paid a visit to Billy's apartment to find him. However, Billy had already left. After a short while as they went on to search the surrounding area, Areas, they found Billy and his girlfriend. The two were subsequently handcuffed and taken to the police station to be questioned. When asked about Regina or Ricky's whereabouts, Billy stated that he last saw them four days ago and hadn't heard from them since. 18-year-old Ricky Lee Jones, after being kicked out of the family home along with his siblings, grew up in foster care. His friends described him as meek. Given that Regina's family situation was also not perfect, the two seemed to click. Officer Jackson explained that Regina was 14 and they were obviously boyfriend and girlfriend at the time that Carolyn handed out the flyers. Knowing that people would be looking for them, they decided it would be best to leave the area so that they would not be caught. And that is when they decided to leave and hitchhike to Mexico. As Ricky was also wanted for auto theft and was nowhere to be found, a warrant 
warrant was issued for his arrest. Having concluded that her disappearance was now a national matter, Agent Jackson listed Regina's information on the National Crime Information Centre, or NCIC, hoping for a breakthrough. On March the 17th, Jerry Walters, Regina's father in Houston, received a phone call from an unknown caller to his unlisted house phone number. Jerry was asked if he was Regina's father. Jerry confirmed that he was and the caller said that he had information about Regina's whereabouts. Jerry was told that Regina was in a barn and that he had cut her hair. If this was true, Jerry was speaking to the man responsible for Regina's disappearance. Jerry inquired as to whether his daughter was still alive, but his query went unanswered. The mysterious caller instead hung up. The call was traced to a gas station 200 miles away from where Regina was last seen. The call remained a mystery until Regina's mother reported a second call on the same night in Texas. She informed the police that the caller had set up a meeting for the following morning at around 7 o'clock. It was to be at the local convenience store and the man would provide additional information about Regina. The caller gave Carolyn no personal information but it was assumed that it was the same individual who had called Jerry. Jerry, Regina's father. Carolyn insisted that she wanted to meet the caller. The police initially thought that it was a bad idea. Eventually, they suggested that she be placed under close surveillance of the police. Carolyn went to the convenience store at the specified time the next morning. She was accompanied by cops who were watching her every move nearby. She waited for over three hours, but the caller never showed up. It was later revealed by the Southwestern Bell phone records that the call was made from a phone booth near the convenience store. So at some point, the man had been there. At that particular time, it was obvious that the police were becoming very concerned about Regina's whereabouts. With the phone calls and the information they had received, they were certain that there was going to be foul play involved. But to what degree, they were as yet unsure. For the next two weeks, neither parents received any calls. Then, Mother Carolyn's phone rang once more. The caller requested a second meeting at the same time and location. Carolyn called the police right away and they were able to trace the call to a nearby payphone. The police rushed to the scene but the caller had already left. Highly frustrating. The man was playing a cruel game. A couple of months passed with no significant information about Regina's whereabouts. She had now been missing for a long time. Law enforcement and Regina's family began to lose hope in her safety. They were preparing themselves that she would eventually be found lifeless and a body was discovered not long after. 26 miles from Houston in Manville, Texas, two little boys discovered human remains as they were walking and playing. Having been informed of their children's shocking discovery, the parents rushed to the police. The police arrived at the scene, but they were unable to identify the body right away. It was sadly badly decomposed. When it was eventually determined that the body was most likely that of a minor, Pasadena, Texas officers sent Regina's records to Manville Police Department for a possible match. The dental records, however, did not line up. They were back once more to square one. More bodies were discovered in the area as the calendar turned its pages into the fall of 1990. One of them happened to be in Bond County. An elderly farmer decided to donate his old barn to the fire department as he hadn't used it in a very long time. He returned to the abandoned building one last time, making sure anything of value had been removed. Instead, he stumbled upon a nightmare. He certainly did not expect to come across a skeleton buried among the haystacks. Agent Michael Sheely reported that the body was found in a rural setting near Interstate 70, which was a major interstate that travels through Bond County. Nothing else was discovered at the scene except for baling wire and a single white thread made of cotton. It appeared to the technicians that the thread must have been placed there recently. It was also determined that the baling wire was used to strangulate the individual. They believed they were female and in their middle teenage years. Further examination revealed that her hair had been cut and that the remains had been there for nearly a year. At the time, there were over 900 relevant missing persons cases that matched the girl's description. Agent Sheely began submitting information about the girl to the National Crime Database. Agent Suzanne Jackson from Pasadena realised that the description 
description fit Regina K. Walter's profile. She rushed to contact the Bond County Sheriff's Office. She was informed that hundreds of other people had contacted them regarding this matter. She was just one of many, many callers. Agent Jackson suddenly remembered what the caller had said to Regina's parents, that her hair had been cut and that she was in a barn. When she told the investigating officers that her victim was said to have been in a barn, she was then asked for a copy of Regina's dental records. The body was then identified as that of Regina K. Walters. Ricky or Ricky's body, on the other hand, was nowhere to be found. Ricky Lee Jones was then suspected of being the perpetrator. When the detective arrived at the Jones family residence, only his sister Tammy was present. She reported to the officers that she had not heard from Ricky in over a year. This wasn't normal. When asked if Ricky had any relatives in Mexico, Sister Tammy replied that their mother had some in Metamoros. Tammy was then shown a photograph of Regina. She had no idea who she was. Agent Suzanne Jackson stated that, Since Ricky was already listed as wanted because he had violated his probation, the police were under the impression that perhaps he was afraid to come home. They were in fear that he may not want to call and tell them what had happened to her. Local detectives decided to enlist the help of the FBI and Special Agent Mark Young was assigned to the case. Young developed a detailed profile of the criminal and it was clear that Ricky Lee Jones was not likely to be the culprit. The profile, the location and any available evidence just didn't add up. According to Young, if Ricky Lee Jones had murdered Regina, he would have done it in a fit of anger, and that would have been reflected in the crime scene. The crime scene was rather controlled and purposeful. You have got the impression that this was an older person, probably a white male, a traveller, a truck driver, somebody that had a reason to be across the country. On May the 26th, 1990, a partial skeleton was discovered in a creek bank 200 miles north of Houston. The puncture in the skull indicated that it was caused by a sidearm. Though not confirmed, the body was thought to have been that of Ricky. This discovery further ruled out Ricky as the perpetrator. A bigger, more scary picture was slowly starting to pull into focus. 27-year-old Lisa Pennell met a driver at a coffee shop in Buckeye, Arizona. The man appeared to be decent in the sense that he did not try to take advantage of her. Thinking she would be safe, Lisa decided to leave with him, accompanying him on a road trip, an adventure in his truck. Exhausted from the long journey, she went to the sleeping compartment and fell asleep. A while later, the driver pulled over and climbed into the compartment. There, Lisa was chained, assaulted and violated. While she was still chained, the man started talking to her, telling her that he had been doing this for about 15 years. He also added that his name was Whips and Chains. She desperately tried to fight back, but as her hands were chained, her attempts were destined to fail. A fighter, she attempted to bite the man's throat instead. However, he moved and she ended up biting him on the upper left shoulder. The pain she caused him was enough to keep him from assaulting her for a second time. Lisa, shackled and unable to flee, had no choice but to sit and wait for help, hoping to be rescued from the man that she had bitten, enraging him further. On April 1st, 1990, Arizona Highway Patrolman Michael Miller observed a truck parked on the side of Interstate 10 near Casa Grande, Arizona. It had its emergency lights on, but no reflective triangles were out. This could have signalled that the driver had suffered a medical emergency. Miller pulled behind the truck and approached it to check on the driver and see what the situation was. With a flashlight, he took a look at the windows of the truck. He noticed some lights in a sleeping compartment and heard a woman screaming. However, he could not exactly tell if she was in danger. The driver slid out of the sleeping compartment, came all the way down to the pavement and put his hands up against the side of the truck. Officer Miller asked him if everything was alright and the driver replied that they were doing just fine, saying that he and the screaming woman were actually together. He went on to tell Miller that he was carrying a gun in his pocket. Officer Miller then patted him down, discovered the gun and placed it in his own pocket. He described the whole situation as bizarre. 
and said that the man seemed quite smooth. Suspecting that something else was going on, he handcuffed him and took the man into his patrol car. When Officer Miller headed back to the truck, he found Lisa unclothed, chained to the wall by both hands and ankles with a horse bit in her mouth, covered in welts and whip marks. He covered her up and assured her that the driver would not bother her anymore, telling her she had to wait a little longer because this was now a crime scene. He then left the truck and moved back to his car just in time. The man had manoeuvred his cuffed hands in front of him and was in the process of trying to get keys out of his pocket. Miller cuffed him again and took him to the Casa Grande Police Department for questioning. Casa Grande Police arrived on the scene to discover gruesome details in the dungeon-like truck. There were hand cuffs on the ceiling, a briefcase filled with chains, fish hooks, alligator clips, whips, leashes, as well as pins. The briefcase, or kit, was described by one FBI agent as one of the most refined kits he had ever seen. In addition to the briefcase, the investigators found a camera, women's jewellery and clothing, and several strands of hair that did not appear to belong to Lisa. During her interview, she told the detective she had been shackled and violated, and that the man would take her out of the truck on lonely stretches of road with a leash around her neck like a dog. However, the detectives thought she was strange, which resulted in a difficult prosecution. Police said Lisa was talking about all sorts of crazy stuff, microchips in her brain, holes in the ozone layer. She was wearing those fuzzy line slippers, but she was telling the truth. Lisa agreed to press charges for aggravated assault, intimate violation and unlawful imprisonment against the man. The man was 45-year-old Robert Ben Rhodes. With his seemingly uncontrollable libido, working as an interstate truck driver presented Rhodes with the perfect opportunity to act out his aggressive perversions, giving him access to strangers he would meet along the road, with or without their consent. In Rhodes' version of this event, Lisa was a complete lunatic. When he was brought in for questioning at around 3am, he appeared calm. He referred to Lisa as a lot lizard, looking for lonely truck drivers at truck stops. He went on to say that she had solicited him and he had no time for such women. Despite the fact he claimed they did not engage in intimate acts, he strangely said that she liked it rough. When asked why he shackled her to the wall, he refused to provide the officers with a concrete answer or admit to any crime. Something that fit Lisa's version of events was the bite mark located on Rhodes' shoulder. He attempted to refute Lisa's claims by arguing that he got the injury whilst he was loading his truck. Although the mental state of the distressed woman was indeed questionable, detectives found Lisa's story more credible as it was consistent. In December 1990, 45-year-old Robert Ben Rose was sentenced to six years in prison for aggravated assault, intimate violations and false imprisonment. Steve Smith, first assistant in the Texas 112 District Attorney's Office, said that he had been a prosecutor since 1979, and when Rhodes entered the courtroom, he could feel the evil. He added that the case of Rhodes was one of the rare cases where the hairs on his arms stood up. Robert Ben Rhodes was a long-haul truck driver who crisscrossed along America's highways for years. But behind the wheel of his big rig, Rhodes was hiding a dark secret. His assertion to Lisa that he had been doing this for 15 years amounted to a confession. In pursuit of any traces of his actions, Rhodes' information was listed on the National Crime Database, as well as the Violent Criminal Apprehension Program which allowed Houston police to intervene. Upon reviewing the information, they they realised that Rose seemed to fit the description of a previous false imprisonment case in Houston, Texas. The detectives contacted the police department right away and obtained the report. He discovered that Rhodes was linked to the abduction of a woman named Shana Holtz. Upon further investigation, they found that both Shana Holtz and Lisa Pennell were victims of the same culprit. Recognising this newfound gravity of the case, the detectives requested assistance from the FBI. This was in order to gather further evidence and build a solid case against Robert Ben Rhodes. As Agent Lee delved deeper into Rhodes' life, he became convinced that Rhodes had been committing these crimes for a very long time. He believed that the refined kit found in the briefcase in Rhodes' truck, along with the controlled crime scenes, were indicative of a long history of criminal activity. 
He was also certain that Rhodes' home would uncover more cases. On April 6, 1990, the FBI secured a search warrant and raided Rhodes' apartment. There, they found a horrifying array of items that pointed towards Rhodes as being a serial predator. They found bondage paraphernalia, chains, handcuffs, a rack that someone could be tied to, a lot of women's jewellery, reddy brown stained towels among women's clothing, and stacks of photographs in his drawer. The photographs were of a teenage girl with short hair in various stages. She was unclothed, bound and bruised in some of the photos. The wide range of photographs in which the girl had different hair lengths and bruises demonstrated that she had been held for a very long time. The FBI believed that Rhodes kept the photos as souvenirs to relive the events. The detectives, however, were unable to identify the girl in the photographs. Lisa Pennell, at that point, was their only concrete witness. Rhodes' six-year sentence in prison came complete with work release eligibility for his crimes against Lisa. According to his lawyer, he could be out on parole very soon. Back to the Regina K. Walters case, her skeletal remains were discovered in September 1990 in an abandoned barn in Illinois. As of October 1991, her case had remained unsolved. One day, FBI Violent Crime Squad agent Robert F. Lee overheard FBI agent Mark Young on the phone with a police officer discussing Regina's case. He told Young that he had a case he had worked on a few months ago in which a truck driver kidnapped a young girl whose hair was then cut short. The girl was Shana Holtz, the woman that fled the truck at the brewery, and was subsequently found on the freeway on Monday, February the 5th, 1990. In a moment that must have hit like a ton of bricks, it was further discovered that the day that Shana managed to escape was the exact same day that Regina K. Walters and Ricky Lee Jones were last seen alive. Checking back through the records, the man that Shana refused to press charges against was Robert Ben Rhodes. Following this shocking discovery, the FBI launched an investigation about Robert Ben Rhodes for false imprisonment and murder. The woman in some of the photographs discovered in Rhodes' apartment was identified as Regina K. Walters. These photographs really are a window into a hellish experience for Regina. A black dress found in his apartment was also confirmed to be the dress that Regina wore in some of the photographs. The hair on Regina's head was very short and the forensic report told FBI agent Mark Young something invaluable. Hair on Regina's intimate areas had also been shaved prior to passing. This turned out to be another signature aspect of the killer. The white cotton thread found in the barn also matched to Rhodes' towels. However, these results ended up as inconclusive as those types of towels were commonly available and used by many people. With Rhodes' release date approaching, the detectives needed to solidify the case as soon as possible. They couldn't risk having a monster like this in public again. Detective Michael Sheely met with Robert Ben Rhodes in Arizona to confront him about the murder of Regina K. Walters. During interview, Rhodes was said to be cold and calculated. He did not have any trouble with looking Sheely in the eye and saying that he had not been involved. Even when he informed Rhodes that they had an arrest warrant for murder, Rhodes remained stony-faced. He then placed a photograph of Regina on the table in front of Rhodes and said the chilling words, This is your victim. Sheely recalled this event as the first time he was able to elicit any emotion from him. It was not, however, a feeling of sadness or guilt. It was one of rage. Sheely's visit came to an end as Rhodes abruptly got up, announced that the meeting was over and left in a hurry. Having failed to get a confession out of him, the detectives decided to interview Mike Eagleton, Rhodes' former trucking employer from Houston. He was able to provide Rhodes' vehicle identification number as well as his trucking logs and fuel receipts. The fuel receipts were traced back to a gas station in Ann's, Texas, dated March the 17th, 1990. That harrowing phone call that Father Jerry Walters received was on this exact same day and from the exact location. It was also discovered that Regina's mother Carolyn's phone calls corresponded with the locations tracked using Rhodes' trucking logs. A solid case was coming together. 
The case of Ricky Lee Jones remained a mystery until 2003. The detective who was trying to locate Jones came across a young white male's remains logged in Mississippi on the National Crime Database. He then reached out to law enforcement. They were able to obtain some teeth from the remains in Mississippi. He then received biological samples from Ricky Lee Jones's mother. These DNA samples were a match. Ricky Lee Jones was finally located. However, not all of the remains could be found. The body was incomplete. This made it impossible for Robert Ben Rose to stand trial for the abduction and murder of Ricky Lee Jones due to lack of evidence. Despite the fact that no official link could be established, it was widely believed that he ended 18-year-old Jones's life before murdering his girlfriend, Regina K. Walters. However, unlike Jones, Rose did not murder Regina right away. Instead, she was held captive for nearly a month. She had been chained, handcuffed, severely tortured and violated until she was strangulated with a baling wire and then thrown into the abandoned barn. The detectives also added that the wire that Regina was strangled with was twisted so many times that it was more than lethal, giving a probable cause of death. When the detectives turned to the Violent Criminal Apprehension Program, they came across over 50 positive matches with Rhodes' profile. His trips from Houston to Baltimore and LA and back in a matter of four or five days at a time gave the idea of how many people and remote locations he had access to. He could maltreat people and dispose of them in these locations. Quite the horrifying prospect. Rhodes' old truck was tracked all the way back to Houston. Since Rhodes' conviction, the truck had been used for other purposes and had thus since been cleaned numerous times. However, it appeared that it had not been cleaned thoroughly enough to get rid of all evidence. Astonishingly, a strand of hair and a small fingerprint recovered from the truck were determined to be that of Regina K. Walters. This discovery proved that Regina had been in the truck at some point. In 1994, with the consequences of his actions closing in around him, Rhodes agreed to a plea bargain in order to avoid the death penalty. With a smile on his face, he admitted to murdering Regina. Gina K. Walters. He received a life sentence without the possibility of parole. As he was beginning to exit the courtroom, Agent Michael Sheely noticed that there was no one there on behalf of Regina. A sad sight to see. He was determined to convey the family's feelings. He told Rhodes as he began to pass him that it was his pleasure to send him to prison for the rest of his life. Rhodes, visibly upset with Sheely's remark, insulted him in return. Sheely recalled this as his final ever conversation with Robert Ben Rhodes. However, this case is far from over. Robert Benjamin Rhodes was born on November 22, 1945 in Council Bluffs, Iowa. His father was frequently away overseas as he was a US military soldier. According to some criminologists, his father's absence may have caused Rhodes to feel a certain level of longing for him. When his father returned and began to be violent, his longing turned into hatred, altogether bringing a skewed view of what masculinity and male behaviour should look like. Rhodes would later to blame his father for his own misfortunes. This included his inability to hold down a job and his frequent brushes with the law. Despite growing up with this skewed value system, Rhodes had a relatively normal childhood with no indications of the kind of man that he would become. He would play various sports and was part of the school choir. Rhodes' personality, however, shifted over time and his criminal involvements began. At the age of 16, he was arrested when he was found found to have maliciously tampered with a vehicle. A year later, when he was 17 years old, he was arrested for public fighting. He also attended college but eventually dropped out. In 1964, Rhodes joined the Marine Corps. The same year, his father was convicted of violating a minor. His father then ended his life prior to his trial. A few years later, due to his involvement in a robbery, Rhodes was discharged from the army. Concerningly, Rhodes then attempted to join law enforcement. However, he was turned down due to his troubled past. Thank goodness. 
up until he became a truck driver in the 1980s. Rhodes found employment in various industries such as supermarkets and warehouses. In 1973, he married his first wife. They had a son, but the marriage ended in divorce in 1978. Rhodes then married his second wife in 1980. The marriage also ended in divorce in 1984. A year later, Rhodes met his third wife at a bar in Houston, Texas. Wife Deborah stated that Rhodes had been in a pilot uniform when she saw him for the first time. Eventually, though, she learned that Rhodes had not been a pilot at all. Can you actually imagine that? That's just bizarre. Relatively unbothered by Rhodes' deception, she decided to give the relationship a try, as Rhodes seemed otherwise like a decent man. However, she was cheated on by Rhodes with another woman at a party, but the two made up eventually and decided to get married. The question is, was this third time lucky? Throughout their marriage, Deborah realised a drastic increase in Rhodes' libido and change in character. His BDSM tendencies grew and changed into significant domestic maltreatment. This escalated to the point where he attempted to buy a slave for his wife, and he gained gratification from seeing her suffer. When he started to resort to intimately violating his wife and things worsened, third wife Deborah decided to cut off all ties with Rhodes. She was then assaulted by Rhodes when she told him she wanted a divorce after just over a year of marriage. She was eventually successful and divorced Rhodes. She later stated that she she wasn't surprised when she saw her ex-husband getting arrested for kidnapping a woman in Arizona just a few months later. With his dark desires now out of control, working as an interstate truck driver presented Rhodes with the perfect opportunity to act out his aggressive perversions. There was an almost endless supply of strangers he would meet along the road. He would get what he wanted, with or without their consent. Rhodes had the ability to coerce people and get them to trust him. This made it easier for him to lure them into his truck. His criminal patterns played a significant role in linking him with the mysterious disappearances of Patricia Candice Walsh and Douglas Sikowski in January 1990. The remains of Douglas were discovered on January the 21st, 1990 near Interstate 10 outside of Crockett County, Texas. However, he was not officially identified until May 1992 when his dental records were examined. He had been wounded in the head by a firearm. The ballistic evidence found at the scene officially linked Robert Ben Rhodes with Douglas Sikowski. Months after the discovery of her partner, Patricia Candice Walsh was discovered by deer hunters near Rent State 15 in Millard County. However, her body went unidentified while her remains were kept in the basement of the Miller County Sheriff's Office for 13 years. It was determined that the implement attended Douglas's life also ended Patricia's. The detectives believed that Patricia had been held captive for more than a week after Douglas had been abandoned. Once again, a familiar pattern. She suffered brutal maltreatment and was violated by Rhodes in his torture chamber before she took her last breath and was dumped in Millard County, Utah. In 2003, 13 years after her remains were discovered in Utah, Patricia Candice Walsh was finally identified. When the DNA located on a towel that was seized from Rhodes' truck matched with Patricia's DNA, the detectives knew that Rhodes was responsible for yet another murder. By the time Rhodes was linked to Patricia's death, he had already been incarcerated for 20 years for the murder of Regina K. Walters, but was due to be released. Under Utah law, only the murder of Patricia Candice Walsh could be tried. As the families of Patricia and Douglas did not want to testify twice and relive the tragedy, they sought to have the case dismissed in Utah in 2006. They did this because Texas law allowed Rhodes to be put on trial for both murders at the same same time. To Utah Assistant Attorney General Creighton Horton, it made sense to let Texas try both homicide cases at once, saying it spared the victims from having to go through all the proceedings here and then doing it all again in Texas. Rhodes had already been convicted of the first degree murder of Regina K. Walters in Illinois when he was extradited to Texas for the murders of Patricia Candice Walsh and Douglas Sikowski a decade later. In March 
March 2021 in Texas, Robert Ben Rhodes pleaded guilty to the murders of Patricia Walsh and Zugler Sikowski. He was now sentenced to multiple life terms. Although the official death toll stood at just three, not including Ricky Lee Jones, the actual number of Rhodes victims remains unknown. It is also strongly believed by many that Robert Ben Rhodes began committing crimes before he even became a truck driver. Council Bluffs, Iowa, where he spent his early years, was notorious for its high crime rate. At the time, the local police believed that some of the crimes could only be committed by a homicidal maniac. Given his history of criminal activity, Rhodes fit this description perfectly. The victims were people in need of assistance and protection whose families failed to check on them on a regular basis. As a result, crimes were likely to go unreported for long periods of time and the likelihood of being caught was extremely low. What was evident was a significant role his occupation played in Rhodes' ability to elude law enforcement. Given that he was always on the move, he was able to commit his crimes in different states, paving the way for disconnected and inconsistent data resources and investigative approaches. He preyed on hitchhikers and vulnerable people who would readily get into his truck, seeing a friendly face. During the course of the investigation, the detectives initially suspected that his toll was probably in the neighbourhood of 10 to 15 victims. The investigation continued and it is believed that there may have been other victims out there who have yet to come forward. Do you think the punishments fit the crimes here? What do you think could be done to avoid something like this happening again in the future? Let me know down in the comments. Please do hit like if you appreciate what I'm doing here. Thank you to everyone in the Dark Case crew. You too can become a channel member for just 99p. A huge thank you to my patrons, your support makes a massive difference. You too can support my work and be thanked in every video for just $5 per month. So a huge thank you to Rachel David, Kathy Green, David James, Addy Alexander, Karen Jones, L Palmieri, James Harrington, Shane Woodward, Faster River, Stacey Crogerus, Summer Chambers, Mona Corona, Sephiot Variable, Anthony Watson, Jason Coward, Guardian Paler, Jeremy Sebronek, Joy Burton, Dawn Croc, Michelle Mims, Natalie Lundquist and Darlene. Be careful out there and I'll see you soon.